Greetings, it's Wednesday, October 3rd. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by On It. For all your supplemental needs, On It is there for you. You understand me? From the Alpha Brain, the Shroom Tech Immune, and the Shroom Tech Sport. Those are my favorite things that they have. I also love the Mexican chocolate protein. Give On It a try. Go to onit.com right now and press in. Church. And there you have it. 10% off, delivered right to your house. Got to talk to you about something else. This is MMA weekend. Conor McGregor steps into the octagon Saturday night in his first fight in two years. You can bet on things like whether he'll win straight up or whether Khabib will deliver the first round KO. My bookie is going to take action on this this weekend. So I'm telling you right now, I recommend these guys because I really trust them. They're family. And I know you'll be happy all season with my bookie. Now do me a favor. Log on to my bookie right now and double your money. Double your Gitas, use promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, and you'll get the first deposit match 100%. That's promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H. You play, you win, you get paid. Kick this fucking mule, Lee. The fuck is up, Bonnie McFarlane? It's good to be here. It's great to have you. I never come to L.A. Now, so. when I called you yesterday, you go, you were in Hoboken. What the fuck were you doing in Hoboken? There was a, I say Hoboken, which is wrong, but I feel like it sounds better than Hoboken. But, uh, yeah, so there was a, some kind of comedy festival there. Really? Yeah, it's not great. You know, Rich did a show last night, and I went with him so that I could spend some time with him, you know. And because uh, he'd just gotten back from Ohio, and then I was leaving today. This morning for LA, so uh, we didn't have much time uh, to spend together. So I went with him to his show, and and they had a, a porn star on the show. It was porn stars and comics, and so they had this porn star on the show. I don't know who a star. I don't know. This, this seems unlikely, uh, but uh, she did comedy for the first time. And I was thinking, what what kind of appeal is that? Like who? Like isn't that the last thing you want? Is to your porn star talking? Like, you know what I mean? Don't you fast forward through that part? You know, you just want to get to the cocksucking or whatever it is, don't you? At least you're honest about it. Fuck it. <laughs> I mean, who, like. No, you don't want to see that. Stuff. You don't want to. How is, how is that shit. bringing people into it? To a, to, does it, oh, I got to go see this porn star speak. That's like the last thing people want. <laughs> it is because I got lumped into that for a long time. Like, when I first got here, people would have strippers and comics. I was telling Lee, right on Santa Monica Boulevard, across from this place, that when I first got here, we'd go over there next to a 7-Eleven across from the Strasburg Theater, or whatever, it's like an acting thing on Fairfax. Yeah, yeah. Across from there was like a place, 5340, and on Thursday nights they did comedy and burlesque, but topless at the yeah, end. They, they, she would take a top off, and the chick that hosted it was a porn star, and it was god-awful. But yeah. she had 400 people would show up on fucking Thursday. Well, but why? To do, to listen to her? To watch her. She had Just because like she'd show her boobs at the end? Wouldn't it be more comfortable no, no, to the, sit at home the, and the, just Google she, it up? She would just be with a fucking banging dress on and looking like a lady. The rest of the girls who went up would do like a uh, burlesque type thing. Right. And then at the end, they would take their shirts off. But they didn't have a license, so they had to put pasties on the nipples. And I didn't never saw the magic of that. In yeah, comedy. what's the good appeal there? But you take the fifty bucks and you pay rent. The no, no, agreed. Or, I mean, listen, they have they have it in L.A. too, or in uh, New York. There's a uh, this friend of mine, Karen Feehan, does a, a burlesque show um, where you go and you do stand up, and then there's burlesque dancers in between. I, it's like great. I, I'll go do it. I, I you know I, I'll do stand up anywhere anytime. But I don't get it. <laughs> at, the three, at the three or four year level, I was doing comedy. A strip club opened in Denver. When the casinos opened, a strip club opened with, to compete with Shotgun Willie's, the biggest strip club in Denver, and they did comedy on Monday nights. And I would go down there just because I read that Lenny Bruce book, mm -hmm. and he used to do comedy right. with strippers. Right. But I remember getting off stage and going, nobody wants to see me. Right. Well, nobody that wants. situation is the opposite, you know, is like... You want to see strippers if they're stripping, but you don't want to see strippers if they're trying to do stand-up. You know what I mean? You don't want to see... I don't know. Listen. I don't want to see strippers mixed with comedy and no fucking thing. <laughs> I think I'd rather go to a 
comedy club and see strippers and go to a strip club and see com- comedians. Yeah, I don't, you know. Can you imagine, like, if you or I went out <laughs> yes. and they're expecting to see naked girls? <laughs> it's just, it's the same thing as when you go to a restaurant and you don't know there's comedy there and then people get up and start. Have you ever had to do stand-up in a restaurant? where they, It's yeah. the worst. It's so humiliating. And people are eating. And then they get mad and they leave and they're like, you know. <laughs> when I, fr- you know, you always thank the stars. You don't thank the stars while it's happening. You just say, how fucking rude. But when I started comedy, it was attached to a steak night. What do you mean? It was five. It's for fifteen ninety five for steak night oh, and comedy night, oh. or prime rib night or something. So oh, they right. gave you a baked potato, a prime rib, and a little fucking piece of corn, and a comedy ticket for fifteen ninety five. So when the host went up. They were biting and eating. Oh, so they were eating at the same time. Yeah, they were oh. eating. So everybody's eating. Nobody's it's laughing. Especially steak. You. It's like you can't yeah, do you anything can't. else. <laughs> you literally can't do anything else but chew. But I also <laughs> felt bad for the feature act because the feature act was going through it too. Like they would be getting dessert. Right. This place gave you. A sh- <laughs> This plate gave you a shrimp bowl. You know, they gave you a fucking shrimp bowl. Well, that's a pretty good deal, I think. Yeah. Right off the bat, they gave you a shrimp bowl. Unlimited fucking oh peel God. and eat shrimp. Which is just disgusting when you think about it. They're getting them from like some country. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, they're getting tons of this shrimp. And you go in there thinking you're Johnny Bananas. You're dipping the shrimp. And then later on you go home. You have a stomach ache for three days. I can't imagine that the waitresses or the servers are being quiet either during your show, right? No, it was a nightmare. It was just a nightmare. Looking back at it now, like it made me the comic who I am today. But then I would go home feeling fucking defeated. You know, I still do these shows. I go to, you know, because I don't go on the road because I have a kid. Uh, so I do, you know, I say I do every steak and seafood restaurant in the tri-state area. And um, if I do well at these shows, I go home. I drive home feeling shitty because I've had to do what I've had to do to do well. And then if I don't do well, I drive home feeling shitty because, <laughs> I, you know, you, you have an ego about it. It's like there's no winning in some of now, this shit. Now, where do you live now? So I live right in the middle of New Jersey, right in the very center of that how far state. from the city it's about an hour um you know so if, if i'm going in for like a nine o'clock show or something it's fine you know I'll leave at seven thirty. but if you have to be somewhere at seven it's a fucking pain in the ass because that the tunnel gets backed up mm. how did you adjust leaving los angeles going to jersey <sighs> having a fucking kid adopting like nine kids because richie's like half yeah. puerto rican yeah he's got like 19 fucking kids on the side you <laughs> never know to. he's got a daughter in college he's got the other ones driving he, his two kids are they're you know they're one of them's getting married the other one's checked up they're they're uh that's it. they're adults that's they're, it that's amazing yeah i remember when he was like on the struggle when we would talk oh yeah no ago. he was he always talk about his his girls and taking them on stage and now we're doing the same thing to Raina. She's 11. She's funny. She's so funny, though. She's just, she said, I said to her one day, I was watching Louis C.K. on on uh, YouTube, and he does a bit where he fucks a stool. And I was like, Jesus, does every guy do a stool fucking bit? And then she goes, you should do it, but you should ask for consent. <laughs> you curse in front of her? Yeah, I don't care. And what does she think? You know, it's like, I feel like it's like, it's like beer. You would drink a beer in front of your kid, but you wouldn't let your kid drink beer. You know, it's like some things adults get to do and kids don't, you know. And there's also like a time, like she's sworn before when it's been very funny, like in a joke and it's been in context or it's been at the right time in the right place. It's totally fine. How old was the first time she cursed? Oh, she used to do this thing when she was really little where she would, she (laughs) would, she would go through some curses. Oh, my God. It was so funny. But she's never gone in trouble at school. I mean, she knows where, you know, it's when and where. When and where, yeah. Yeah. I'm scared of my daughter picking it up. I picked it up when I was young at my mother's bar in Spanish. And then going to New York, I got it translated to me in English. And it never ended. And that's why I'm the filthy animal that I am today. (laughs) Maybe not. So I know it's irreversible. (laughs) Like, once a kid starts cursing, you can't turn that wheel back. Well, she doesn't, you know, she she doesn't cur like she, you know, her friends, uh, you know, she's, she, you know, I took her to her friend's house the other day and her parents were, she was having a sleepover and her parents said, you know, can you come pick her up at 830 tomorrow morning because we have to go to church and, you know, I was like, oh boy, you know, but she, the, she just knows when and where and she, I, I know she would horrify people if, she, if they really knew <laughs> some of the stuff she said. <laughs> 
I, I'm cr- I'm cringing. I know she said shit one day. <laughs> but I don't think Mercy it's bad. I honestly don't think it's bad. Oh, no, no, no. It's got to start at a certain age. And I'm an old school motherfucker. There's no booze in my house, Bonnie. Yeah, wow. Well. Pretty soon I got to start going for a ride to smoke dope or I got to quit smoking dope. Yeah. And I'm going to have to do it. I have to do it. Oh, they'll know. I grew up around parents. She knows. Oh, yeah, they, they have they her six she cents. She knows bucks. I do something in that bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> right. You follow me. You know how many times I run, like, we're, like we run in and I put things away. Like, we've just been on, like, a two-hour excursion. Yeah. And I'll run in and I'll wash my hands at the sink. And, I'll, and she'll go, Daddy, you going to come draw with me? Yeah, yeah. I go, get everything set up. You know how many times I've gotten into the office? I go into the back. I open up the back door. Thank God I got that back door. I fill up a pipe and I blow the smoke outside. I have a big backyard. Yeah. So I step outside. I come in, I put the pipe in, I pop a piece of gum in, I wash my hands, I lock the door. You know how many times I've opened up that back door and she's been there waiting for me at attention? Oh my, my God. Heart so that means she knows. Well, she knows something's going on. Only one. But also, she smells it. I mean, honestly, you don't, don't smell it because you smoke pile out, but people who don't, they smell it on Well, the people. first time she says something, I know for a fact. That the first time she says something to my wife, her mother, about smelling something, I'm done, even in the back. <laughs> like my wife will let me know immediately, like it's over. Yeah. You better go to the office and get high, put cologne on. And for me, I have to do that. I was introduced to drugs at an early age. My mom had a bar. And I fucking regret it now. Yeah. I regret all the shit I did. Yeah. At least let her make a decision, but not at fucking. I can't have her around. Right, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know, I don't know. give a fuck if weed is legal or not. I don't give right. a fuck about none of that shit. I'm telling you, there's a time and a motherfucking place for everything. Right. When she's 14 and she comes to me and goes, "I smelt these guys smoking weed," then it's time to sit her the fuck down and explain the situation. How many show pounds her how of weed to roll I smoked? It. Yeah. Show her how to show her how to roll put a filter it. in. Listen, my mother showed me fucking heroin, coke, and pot. When wow. I was six. What? Because they had, I had gone to the police athletic league, and they took me to the police station as part of the trip in New York City, and they fingerprint you, they let you shoot a twenty-two, and they give you, like, a junior G-man badge. So they would tell me, like, you know, you have to report mysterious acts and shit. Like that. <laughs> At that time, I knew my mom did something. I just didn't know what it right, was. I right. knew she did something. Oh, I knew, I knew her and her friends did something. And I still remember seeing my mom doing blow. Wow. Out of an aluminum foil, you know, like old Cuban style. Whoa. With women's night when all my aunts would get together <laughs> and shit. I've never known about it. They would play cards and like dominoes and shit. And they would do little bumps. Oh, my God. By the time I was seven or eight, I would tell my mom to wipe her nose. <laughs> oh, my God. Like, mom, wipe your nose. Like, you're fucking embarrassing me. Just... So then, like, when you got older, did it get worse? Did she stop doing it? She didn't stop till she died. Wow, so were you embarrassed of of it? No, or? no, no. It didn't come up in the drug report when she died. It was just a heart attack. No, no, I mean, um, was when you I got embarrassed older. embarrassed about her know. doing blow? Yeah. At that time, nobody, she wasn't doing it like people were doing it now. Right. It wasn't the way she had it under control. She worked in a bar. My mother believed for you to sell drinks, you got to drink. Right. You know, my mother believed that if a woman works behind a bar, her boyfriend should never be in the bar. You know, because uh, he, he he shouldn't see what's just, really going on. No, you just break away the the dream. Oh oh oh, gotcha. I'm in love yeah. with Bonnie. I don't need to know Bonnie's got right, a husband. Right, right. I don't want to be he always. I want to, I want right. her, I want him in there spending money right. every night. Bonnie, can I go out with you? I can't. Bar policy, uh, the normal right, fine. Right. But you never got a boyfriend or a husband. You just don't mention it. You know, when you ring at work. That's how a woman makes fucking money at wow. work. You know what I'm saying? Right. You show those titties a little bit, but not enough. You know what I'm saying? Just mm-hmm. perfect cleavage. When you bend over to get a beer, you go to Texas and go to a bar, every woman has fucking cleavage. Yeah. They, you ever go to a bar in Houston? Even Lee? in New York. They're also, fucking packed. You know. They're packed. You got to show those titties. You got to give me the illusion that I might be able to score with you. Right. That's what's going to get those dollars flowing out of my fucking pocket. You know? It's like when you go to a strip club. And you take a stripper aside when you're going to go a little creepy at the end of the night. How much to spend the night with you? And she's like, meet me at Denny's. And you go to Denny's and she don't show up. You know? Uh, she's got a husband and fucking a thing? six kids. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. You tell them. They'll always tell you, meet me at Denny's. I'll meet you there in 45 minutes. There you are in a car fucking putting cologne on your neck. 
and the chick never shows. <laughs> that was done to me a thousand times. Yeah, the chick, oh, you didn't learn after your first. Time. Yeah, the chick ain't gonna show. The chick showed one time. Oh, and then she just Ooh. ate breakfast. <laughs> yeah, we kind of talked. We kind of talked, and then we went on like a legal date, like three days later, and then I told her I was a stand-up comic. And I was in the process of a divorce. This could only happen to me at the time. Yeah. This could only, you know when you have a bad luck streak? Like, you know when the phone rings and you're like, today can't get no worse. So I'm going through a divorce. We have a child. Uh-huh. This chick went into a barbershop where my wife worked and sat in my wife's chair without knowing. That's how fucking faint it is. Oh, my God. Uh, and she's like, cut me up nice because I'm going out with a comedian this weekend. Oh, no. Are you fucking that's, kidding? That's the luck I had at that time. Did she say your name? Oh, yeah. My wife goes, what's his name? Oh, oh. my God. And as soon as the girl got up and left, my wife she called me. She had one me. fucked up hairdo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the, she's then, lucky she had ears when she left. I don't even think she called me back, the girl. She's like, you didn't even tell me you were married. I'm fucking getting divorced. She goes, no, oh, that's cheating. It's not cheating. I'm just, she's with another guy, and I'm trying to meet another woman. Man. Oh, my God. That that's girl, a crazy story. How crazy is that? That's like a movie. And she was pissed, my ex-wife. Pissed. Of course. This chick was 23, banging big fake titties. Oh, my God. The whole, it could only happen to me. You know what I'm saying? Going I'm, out with the comedians and I yeah. threw me up nice. How many fucking comedians <laughs> live in Boulder, too? And I was one of them. Can you fucking believe that? Oh, There's shit. probably more hairdressers than comedians. There's fucking more everything than comedians in Boulder. Boulder didn't even have a, a, a comedy scene. It's weird. There was a club called the Blue Note that was a jazz bar. Yeah. Is that in New York? No. No, in, in uh, Boulder. Right. And that's where Roseanne used to do a majority of her work. Oh, wow. It was that place and the Denver Comedy Works. Did you try to say, no, she's talking about Roseanne. She's, no. <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> Who's got the your daughter today, Rich? Yeah. He's got the whole week with, with that's, you know, this is a rare thing. Uh, it's an experiment. We'll see how it goes. I really? told Rain. I said, "You got to, you know, he's he's got a he's got a short fuse. So, uh, you know, they get into fights. They're like two children a lot of times. You know, where he tells her to do some, and then she won't do it, and then he yells at her, and then I got to step in, and you know, and, and then she fucks with him because she knows his little idiosyncrasies, and you know, it's nah, it is what it is. They get along. They're they're fun. They love each other, obviously." You know. A father-daughter situation is a weird one to have, especially when the dad is a fucking lunatic. I mean, he's he's got so many weird little fucking things. It's it's uh, you know it's like walking through a minefield sometimes. But but I just called them before I came here, and they're all playing basketball, so they're having fun. Yeah, sixty-one still playing basketball. He does whatever it is, ten thousand steps a day or something. Does that sound right? Some yeah. crazy amount. He's got. He's always like, I gotta do my steps. Gotta put, get my steps in. He's insane because he still thinks that he's gonna somehow. He wants to like do stand up with his shirt off. I don't know. He thinks like he's always like, I'm just gonna lose ten pounds. I was telling him the other day, I was like, What? Well, don't you want to just be happy? Like, wouldn't you rather just be like, Ah, it's good. Fuck you it. look great. You lifting? I do. I do a lot of sh- dumb shit. <laughs> you 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 look fucking great. Like, Thank you. Jesus Christ. Before we started the podcast, we were talking about when I first met you, it was at the improv. It was very casual. We never hung out or nothing. We never really chit-chatted. I'd say hello to you. You'd say hello to me. I forget who you used to hang out with in those days. I like to say it was like Doug Benson. Yes, it was Doug Ben. It was that crew. And uh... What crew was that? Because it doesn't... I'm a comedy store guy. Yeah. But the guy would give me spots at the improv from time to time. And I'd watch you guys. And it was a fun crew. Everybody was very nice. But you guys had your own thing. Well, because we would, we, there was there was a group of us that would work at the improv and then also at the alt, in the alt scene, you know, and we could do both for whatever reason. What was the name of the fucking place that did the alt scene? Fargo. Largo. Largo. Yeah. Okay. And the yeah. guy's name, where was the place where Josh Donato was at? That started at Largo. At Largo. Wait, it might have started at M-Bar and then moved over to Largo. Largo. But he was the guy who the guy. started Largo, and then, you know, obviously they, they... They found out that he was paying them, he was paying the comics, and that's what happened. Oh, is that what happened? Largo was paying the... He was getting names that were absurd. Yeah. 
Dog, the lineup at Largo during the week, like his night, was absurd. It was it was my it was the comedy store meets we, the improv meets the laugh back. Yeah, it was the, yeah. Like six of the best comics working every fucking week. You would sit there and go, Jesus Christ. So yeah, then he teamed up with Mitch Hedberg. Josh D Donato. D Donato did. Mitch started taking him on the road, and then he took him to Toronto. That's where him and Mitch got in trouble for something weird. And then supposedly when he got back here, it got to somebody. Like he was, he had Margaret Cho in there. It got to somebody that Largo was giving him like six hundred bucks a week. That is right. He was not paying, paying the, comedians. the comedians. He was just pocketing all and the it money. It was like the fucking hottest yes, room in Hollywood. Yes, yes. It was the hottest room in Hollywood. I will Hollywood. say this for him: he was the first one to sort of like, you know, he curated a room. You know, he would only put in, he was very, you know, specific about the kind of comic he wanted, and he brought in a certain kind of audience, and then, and he, and he was kind of a little mean to the audience in, in terms of, like, if anybody talked, they were kicked out. It was, he really ran that show, and that's why it became the show that it became. But yeah, he, he, then they kicked him out of it, because... Now, Lago was on Fairfax. It used to be, yeah. Okay, now, what was the place... When we first, when I first got here, that was the hot, hot spot in Boys Town. What's Boys Town? The gay area. Oh. You know, Santa Monica and La Cienega. You made a right, and you went around two blocks, and then you made a left, and you walked around 50 feet, and there was a... The guy Sam used to book it. You had to go downstairs. Oh, the Tuesday Banana night. Club or something, something like that? Something that also became yes, yes. a hot spot for agents yeah. and managers. And yeah. if you walked in there, you got a deal. <laughs> Even Dice was in there one yeah. night. Like, that, that, like wow. Yeah, like if you walked, if you had a spot there on a Tuesday, you got a deal. I remember Like you walked out too. of there with a manager and an agent. Well, that's the thing about L.A. back in the day was that you would be you would do these crazy sometimes. Okay, we used to do this show that was um, at the uh, in the basement of the Ramada in like uh, what the like on Vermont. On Vermont, or something? yes. Yeah. Oh my God, that's that room has been in existence. Now it's a pot hotel. Oh, it is. Yeah, it used to be about three or four years ago. They turned it into a pot hotel and they were doing pot comedy in there. Oh. Oh, it right, okay. It turned into like a pot hotel where you could pot, smoke pot in the hotel room and shit. Jesus. It's got a green leaf outside. It's in a weird neighborhood in Vermont. Yeah, it was. A, I don't yeah. know why we would all, because I guess it was a Monday night. There Monday or Sunday, else. yeah. It was nowhere a good room. To go. And it, it, it should room. be like fucking open micers, people just starting out, and then, you know, like uh, Mark Maron would be there, or, you know, David Cross would show up. Or, like, it was uh, Patton Oswalt. It was like, and all places were like that. It was like... You know, there'd be these because people just wanted to get stage time. It's not like New York where you would get booked on, you know, five shows a night. You know, so you're just always looking for a place. So an open mic, fine, I'll go and I'll get on, and there'll be, uh, you know, fucking ten open micers and, uh, you know, Janine Garofalo and, you know, these like big crazy. stars that were there. You know, what was the comic book place on Silver Lake? Lee just told me. About it, somebody Cosmic Vinyl is that still there? Are I just they did still it. doing comedy there. The vinyl place, yeah. I that used to be the alt scene. The owner, the owner knows you. The owner yeah. listens to the podcast. The, the, that used to be the alt scene. Yeah, and isn't Duncan it not booked anymore? it for a couple yeah, weeks. Yeah, I I left before that. And when Duncan booked it, I went in there and ate a bag of dicks for that. <laughs> you I, did? Oh my god! Because it was just Silver Lake. It was like you know, uh, what what do they call them now? Hipsters. Hips, hipsters. Hipsters. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It was hipsters before they were even known. They were hipsters. Right. And then there used to be a taco place. That whole area used to have tremendous comedy. What's that fucking... Yeah, other? Silver Lake. Before Silver yes. Lake was Silver Lake. That you, one Mexican bar yes. in Silver Lake was badass. Yeah, yeah, they gave yeah, you a free yeah. margarita when you did a spot. And listen, if you were getting a free margarita, that was yeah. a pretty good yeah. fucking well, deal. Well, you got to remember, if you were getting a free margarita, that means you were getting two free margaritas. <laughs> because you gave the bartender a fin, and, yeah. gave, and now you had two in your, under your belt. <laughs> now you had a little pep to your step. Because to get they, you to the even improv. if you were getting, you know, they wouldn't give you a fucking soda at these places. Like you were getting, you weren't getting paid, and and you had to, you know, put out for anything you wanted at the bar for most of those places. You know. Then there was a they street, treated comics like shit. Like shit in those days, and the and the promoters were making a little bit of money, 
and they would break you off like three drink tickets, and that was oh, yeah. huge. Oh, yeah, yeah. And if you killed, he'd give you an extra one. Here's an extra one, dog. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's why the improv was so great, because they, uh, they would send you your check. They'd pay you by check, but they would let you um, run a tab at the bar. So my whole theory was is I'm going to, you know, run up a tab at the bar so they have to keep booking you so because then they just take it out of your check you know i never ever got a check because that's brilliant I never, just, I, never, <laughs> I never even knew there was a tab available at the fucking tab, bar. yeah it's always, i was buying people drinks so it's like and then um yeah then at some point they stopped letting you uh you, you run up a tab you that's know but that was, those were the good days because in the improv you'd Oh man, we used to get so fucked, fucked up, up there. Fucked up. That was where the party started. Yeah, and they had that going. big bar there. It was so I don't know. If, I don't think they have that. Used to be that packed in there. And oh people yeah. People eating dinner there. That's when Bud used to go down there and eat dinner with Hartman. But there would be huge would stars be, in there yeah. too. I remember going in there one time and um, Ellen DeGeneres was in there with uh, Anne Hache when they were dating, and um, she was talking to me, and and uh, so I was talking to. Anne Haitian and uh, and uh, Ellen DeGeneres and Bill Maher walked in and he sees the three of us in the corner and he goes, "Hello, lesbians," <laughs> and I was like, that's "Excuse Bill- me, <laughs> I might add something." That's when Bill Maher used to hang down there a lot. Yeah, he used a to. Lot. Yes, yeah. He, that's yeah. why I met him the first time. They put me on his show to do a sketch, and he was always like, "Tell you know." At least he was he- friends with Ron Zimmerman, I think, who would drag him in there all the time. He's friends with weird people. Yes. He's good friends yes. with the kid in play. Oh, he is? Yeah. With kid, the one that we had on the podcast. Really? The flat That's top. one of his best friends. He does the music for the show. Oh, if, I didn't know if that. You watch the end of the show. I had no idea. It's kid that did the theme or something for it. Oh, my God. Like, he has. Now, do you still remember this Bill Maher story? When I first got here, I got here because of Doug Stanhope. Doug Stanhope did Seattle, and they told me, come down, you're going to do great. And about f- three weeks later, I was I got here, and I remember that he said something to me. He goes, "We'll try to get you spots at the Improv, but right now I'm not doing too good there." Let me see your nails again. They're beautiful, Bonnie. Look at you. Take care. <laughs> You're a fucking hot mom. Thank uh, you. Uh, he goes, I'm "Come do this podcast more often." Yeah, yeah. He goes, "I don't. I'm not in good terms at the Improv right now for a few days. So I'll tell you when I'll get you in. When I first got here. So I said, "What'd you do? How come you not?" He goes, "Ah." Bill Maher had a party, and I fucked some girl in his bed, so Bill Maher called the improv complaining and oh, said that Doug Stanley had a fucking write, write douchebag a letter he to him. is. I like, personally apologize for him fucking the chick wow. in his bed. Bill Maher can go suck a dick. I, I, I mean, who, like... The, if you if you're that pissed about it, say something to Doug Stanhope. Don't try to take work away from the guy. That's a fucking shitty move. It was you know it was a different time then. He was a different person. <laughs> you know, you walk into your bedroom, somebody's fucking doggy style in your bed. <laughs> you know, it wasn't you, his girlfriend. You got kids. I think something. I think it was the girl he wanted to fuck. Uh, something crazy. Uh, he was really gonna bring him down. I opened for Bill Maher a couple times, and uh, one time I was in the green room and. Uh, you could hear the guy on stage, the the MC or whatever, you know. And I laughed at the guy, and he told me I had to get out of the green room <laughs> if I was gonna laugh. <laughs> I was like, I How many so. years have you been doing comedy for now? Twenty three years, yeah, a long time. Mm-hmm. And you started in Canada, and you were up there for how long? Um, I didn't do stand up in Canada very long. A couple of years, and then. Uh, I uh, I I moved to New York. I it's a, it's a funny story, but I called. See, in Canada, when you were starting out, we were talking about Yuck Yucks before the the we started the podcast. But they wouldn't promote you as a comedian. They would only promote comedy. So you could never get out from under the Yuck Yucks hold, you know, because you could never you know go sell tickets on your own. You had to use the Yuck Yucks name. And uh, people complained about it all the time. And I was like, fuck this shit. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to the States. And, uh, you know, they had Caroline's Comedy Hour was, you know, uh, one of the big shows back then. And um, I called Caroline's, the club. I just looked, at, you know, got the number and, and called the club. And I said, who books the TV show? No one there seemed to know what I was talking about. <laughs> so they put me through to the manager I think his name was Joe Falzerano or something like that. And um, I'm talking to the guy, and I said, I want to do your TV show. And it turned out he really was the guy who booked the TV show. And um, he said, uh, okay, uh, 
you know, he asked me some questions about myself. He was kind of, you know, amused, I guess, by what the fuck is this girl? And then um, he asked me if I was cute. And uh, I was like, yeah, I think so. <laughs> and um, he said, okay, I have some workmen in my office. They're fixing the ceiling. I'm going to put you on speaker. And if you can make them laugh, I'll, I'll give you the show. So he put me on speaker and I have my notebook open. And I ran through some jokes and I heard the workers laughing. And I did a little crowd work and uh, he gave me the show from, from doing that. So then... Um, I I came to to New York and and did Caroline's Comedy Hour. What year is this? So that there was the last year that 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 show was happening. So I don't know which what year that was, but mid to late nineties, probably right. like ninety six, ninety six or ninety seven, maybe something like that. And uh, yeah, I was just young. I bombed really bad too. Where they sure. tape at Caroline's? Obviously. At Caroline's, right, right. I remember yeah. that. And I got my manager through that and everything, and then um, I had to go back for a little bit to Canada. And you know, just a couple weeks later, I was back in New York for good. And I was like, I got a, a an apartment in uh, in Harlem, fully furnished apartment for five hundred bucks a a month. Was, no rats. No rat. It was a really nice apartment, but uh, yeah, the woman who lived there. Had, just died and the people were looking for someone to just sort of stay in the stay in the place until they could um you know sell it or whatever so i got i just got lucked out yeah but no one would come visit me back then <laughs> Harlem. but you know you seize an opportunity what street was it on 125th and broadway oh that's a fucking phenomenal neighborhood yeah it was what great. year was this so that was like 97, I guess. 95 was the last season on the show. Okay, so 95, 96, then I was in, in um, and then I only stayed a year and then and then came to L.A. So when you were on 25th Street, there was a couple bodegas on the block that sold reefer. Oh, I didn't know that. You never went down there? I mean, I, I cruised around. Did you around. ever walk up to 125th to the, to the Kentucky Football? What, what the heck? Is it Popeye's? Epson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a Popeye's a there. Popeye's right there. by right the train up, station. And down the block from the theater. Yeah, Apollo. Theater. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would get that was my weed neighborhood. But I'll tell you, I mostly walked the other direction. Yes, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. That's I didn't know that you lived in Harlem, and then you came out here. Then I came out to L.A. and I had a deal already by then. I got a development deal right away. Now, when were you on SNL? I never did it. I never was on SNL. Oh my that was God. His... I thought you wrote on SNL or some shit. No, no, never did nothing. Nothing. I, I mean, I told you the story before that people would say, right, were you on I, SNL? Yeah. But they just, I never did. I they never don't really it. know. It's so crazy when you go out there and people tell fake credits and shit. And then after them, I saw people actually get stumped. Like, you ever see comics get stumped? What do you mean? Like a comic would go up. Let's say an L.A. comic would be on a triple run. And he would be an extra on Star Trek, The Next Generation. Yeah. The, the MC would say it. Coming to the stage, you've seen him on Star Trek, The Next Generation, and afterward when he get off stage, people come up to him and go, you know what, I'm a Star Trek nerd, what episode were you? Oh my God. And the guy would sit there and go like, episode 338. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, who are you, are you the guy? And he's like, no, I'm the guy that walked past the guy. He goes, oh my God, did you get to talk? It was crazy. They were just being doing extra Well, that's work. like a, that's a, I know, but that's like a shitty show to lie about because those people really do know. No, but any of those shows, always, yeah. there's always somebody in the audience who geeks out on you yeah. and says, what episode yeah. did you yeah. do? You know, it's like when yeah. Seinfeld was on. Right. When Seinfeld was on, if you did an episode of Seinfeld that weekend, you sold out. Yeah. Wow. That's it. You sold tickets because they won, like when he played the Umbrella Man, didn't Don Marrera? Yeah, he, Don Marrera was on there a few times. A few times. It's yeah, that made you famous. Man. Made you famous. Coming to the Kentucky, the Umbrella Man from right. Seinfeld. You're buying tickets. Right. It's so different now. You do an, oh. you can do but 10 episodes. But there's so much shit out. I mean. You can do 10 episodes of a show and nobody knows who the fuck you are. You know, it's so crazy. Okay, like I, I don't watch The Walking Dead. I've never seen it. So if one of those guys walked in here, I wouldn't, I would just treat him like a normal dude. I wouldn't know who it is. And for somebody else, that's the most famous person in the world. So fame is really weird. It's like person to person now, you know? It's, it's whatever show you fucking watch. Yeah, I don't watch a lot of TV, so I don't, like, I don't fucking know. Right. I'm a comic, man. If you watch TV, it's kind of like, now you're, you're more accessible to watch TV because you can watch Netflix and Hulu, 
When I first got into comedy in the early 90s, I just stopped. Like TV had become something that I never watched. I had one in my apartment, mm -hmm. but I watched like the news at five. Like I didn't know what TV shows were on. I didn't watch TV till I came out here and I got called in for NYPD Blue. And I said, let me, I should fucking watch it before I start yeah. auditioning for this shit. And I watched it, and that's that. That was the first time I had watched TV in like eight years. I, I, you know, it's so funny. I didn't watch TV at all. I didn't even have a TV uh, until I met Rich. Rich came to my apartment in LA here, and he bought me a TV. That was the first. Uh, t I mean, I, you know, obviously I'd been at other people's houses. I watched TV a little, you know. But when I came to LA and I started having meetings with these executives, and they'd say, "What TV show do you like?" and I'd say Murphy Brown or something. I don't know. I didn't know what to say. I just, I've never, you know, I would say just weird things that I'd heard. <laughs> I just, um, like, I don't even think Friends was on yet, you know, or anything. When did Friends come on? I think like 97, maybe. Yeah, if you did Friends, you became a star. Aisha Taylor, that's how she. Yes, right. Aisha right. Taylor. So there were certain shows that if you did those shows that weekend. 94. Yeah, that weekend oh, okay, you were so. hot. That weekend you I were hot. I could have said friends. Yeah, that weekend you were hot in a pistol. That doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. But you, you know, like I told you before the show, I'll never forget. There used to be a girl, like a group of comic girls, that used to go to the improv that hung out with a guy with a van, that smoked pot in the parking lot behind the improv. Like we would go to the parking lot, and I'll never forget that one night we were out there smoking pot. And that was the night I had a conversation with you, like a semi-conversation about, because you were with Sussman or something. Yeah, that's the manager that I got when you I got You were with Sussman at the time, and you got rid of him. Something yes, had happened. Yes, yes, yes. Like, I had to pay him for years after I left him. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. back then he had con like actual fucking written contracts, and he wouldn't yeah. let me out of the contract. So I had to pay him 15% or whatever for years. Yeah, he didn't play. He doesn't play at all. Yeah, not yeah. But he's went, Rogan's manager. He's Rogan's manager and Kevin James. We were talking about something. Fuck, I was just thinking about it. And that's how I got to know you yeah. a little bit. You were telling me about something you were doing. And then I just see... Uh, Whose van improv. was that? Somebody know. that would just go there and smoke pot. And <laughs> I'm sure I 20 just... 20 of us would go out there and I get high in a would... fucking guy with a van. <laughs> if anybody and he'd said open you up the back that. doors and we'd sit there and smoke with the oh, guy. Man. And one of the girls, believe it or not, that was hanging out in those days was the girl that ended up on Chelsea lately that she travels now. She was on the podcast talking about eating goat cheese. Heather McDonald. Heather oh, McDonald. Heather McDonald, yeah. Heather McDonald yeah. was out in those days. That was 98, 97 yep. with her long fucking legs. And we'd start at the improv and go to Largo. She then, was always a fun girl. Yeah, yeah. and then we'd yeah. go to fucking that, that Chinese <laughs> restaurant, the legendary one. On uh, that street, it's the name of the fucking street, right off of uh, La Brea. Uh, I think it's Melrose or Santa Monica. It's a well-known Chinese place where everybody used to drink in the 50s. Steve McQueen, they just redid it. I forget now, who the fuck knows. But I, I remember being in there one night, and we weren't doing comedy. We just, like, I was broke living in a car then. You were? And I was having more fun <laughs> than... Like, yeah, I was living, like, in front of Ralphie's house. Oh, my God. And some nights, Ralphie would let me in. And some <laughs> nights, he'd be sleeping already. Was that when he lived in that place where he had the most massive stairs? He used to live in a place where it was, like, the, the highest, steepest stairs to get up to. And I'd be like, why, Ralphie? No, no, no. Why? This is This is when he was still broke. <laughs> this is when he was on. When we were this on, was was like, yeah, this is when he was in Doug Stanhope's. Doug Stanhope, had, a friend, had rent, Andy Eindrist had rented that apartment, and he went to Alaska to oh. live with a girl. So Doug Stanhope took it over, and Ralphie needed a place to stay. Trust me, there was no stairs there. Ralphie broke the toilet eight times yeah. in two years. Oh, my God. Are you fucking yeah, it was, kidding me? It was a toilet me. for, like, a Hollywood, you know. <laughs> it was like a condo for, like, Hollywood bimbets in the 50s. And Ralphie's dropping 600 pounds, cracking the toilets <laughs> fucking Ralphie, once a month. We were going to a gig once, and the car was rubbing. He was so heavy that the car was, like, leaning down, like, you know, and it was like. Was he, this the forerunner? Yeah, and he could yes. hear it going. And he goes, I don't know what that is. And I was like, I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, he popped the fucking springs in the, that car. 
Let me tell you something. Toyota, if you know where that car is, buy it and put it in your fucking showrooms. Like, if you go to a... Uh, this is a Toyota place in Denver. When you walk in the showroom, they had a car with five million miles or three million miles, something crazy. It had gone around the earth twice, just to, and it still ran. Wow. They would prove. So they wanted all those cars back. Right. I, well, here's Ralphie's. Yeah, so Ralphie, I think Ralphie's nephew still has the form. Oh Ralphie God. gave it to him when he won last comic standing. They fixed it up. Yeah, because it was right before that. I yes. remember him talking about that he'd done a pilot for the the last comic standing. And then I was like, it, it was before reality shows. So he was, he was trying to explain it to me. We all live in a house. I was like, it sounds awful. You know, he's like, no, it's going to be a great show. I'm going to do the show. That's funny that Jay Moore created it at the time. Yeah. That's how hot he was after Jerry. We got here, Jay, Jay well, Moore. Well, Jay Moore was at the top of his fucking, fucking game. game. For a while there, he was like on every show and, and he when couldn't miss. He was in every show. movie. Remember, they gave him the first, he played the agent. Right. And then they gave him a show on Fox oh, as that's an agent. Why. That's why. Right, right, and right. And him and Ralphie became tight. And then he would Ralphie would open for him on the road. In that process, him, Jay Moore, had a black friend that was really funny, but didn't do stand-up. But stand not a up. comic? No. He was a black dude that was funny. And he would bounce shit off people. Like he would, like Jay would keep him around to bounce stuff. And I forget what his name is. It was him and Jay that created. Well, Ralphie last went time, comic stand. I went to uh, I did I opened one time in Vegas for um, Jeff Ross, and Ralphie was the MC. That's how long ago. And Jeff would say to Ralphie every night, "You got to do all your time before Bonnie," because he couldn't follow it. Even if Ralphie did five minutes after me, Jeff would have a hard time with it because he was fucking funny. He was funny. So he would do all his time before me, and then I'd have to go out there and eat it for a half hour, and then Jeff would go on. And every night we'd go back to Jeff's room, or Ralphie's, I don't remember, but, uh, you know, smoke pot, and Jeff would say, hey, what about this? And Ralphie was just so good at telling him, oh, you put in your punchline before your setup, or, you know, D do that joke before you do that joke, or here's a line, you know, just smoke, not caring about it. He wasn't, like, really thinking, and... Jeff was making notes and writing it down, and he was just good at, at doing that. And I, it, you know, when he got on Last Comic Standing, he was already a headliner. Yeah, that's what people yeah. have to understand. Yeah. that's why it was impossible for that fan to win, and people knew it and they felt weird about it. But NBC had to go with some ethnic. So I don't know. I, I don't know what went down. But Ralphie, I remember doing the same with him at his house at two in the morning. While he was cooking, he was the guy that told me that I had to stop playing for the back of the room. He told me right to right, my face. Right, right, right. You know, people think that people are like me, like like if I say something to Lee, they'll hit me with a tweet later. Ah, oh, you shouldn't talk to Lee that way. I'll never forget, like, the comedy advice I got was all bad. Like, anybody who ever said something to me about my set wasn't pleasant. He was trying to help me. <laughs> Well, it's not pleasant. Right. But that's, you know, we, we're, the, the business that we're in is that w there's no school or anything. How you learn is other comedians. So if the comedians that are ahead of you don't tell you, then, you know, it's like there's things that you can't fucking know until somebody tells you about it, you know? And now everyone's so nice. It's like acting class all the time. You're great. You're great. Yeah. No, let me and tell you something. So He's, people aren't getting better in some ways. He said something to me, Bonnie. I'm going to tell you what it is now, and I might cry. Oh, no. Because he was cooking, as he said it to me. He was cooking. He was 600 pounds, 700 pounds. He barely fit in the kitchen in those days. He would have to do like a 360, like a robot, in the kitchen to turn around. And that's why he used to drink all his orange juice. And he would go crazy. Coco, really? <laughs> yeah, that's you, a good you, you left me a swallow of orange juice? He said <laughs> something to me one night, and I was high on coke. And I fucking didn't even sleep on this floor. I just went in my car and cried. That's how hard he hit me one night. And I never s held it against him because he turned me into a comic. What did he say? He said that I had blown up the room. He goes, you blew up that fucking room tonight, Coco. You're the funny motherfucker. And he said something. He was, we were still broke. I mean, everybody was broke. Right. I was living off him. He was living off his mom. Somebody was sending him checks. Mm -hmm. He was opening up for Jay Moore. Like, he was headlining. Yeah. 
and he was staring, whatever the fuck he was cooking, and he goes, you're only, you're not going to get, I don't even know how he said it. Right. He said to stop playing to the back of the room. Right. He goes, you're not going to, you're going to starve until you learn how to play in the front of the room, Coco. You keep playing to the back of the room, and those people don't pay in the back. They're comics. Right. And I remember looking at him like, what the fuck are you talking about? Playing to the back of the room. What the fuck? And I, and I, said, I remember getting in the car and popping the car seat back and going, he's right. It's a tough lesson to learn. It's right? tough. When I go back there, I'm worried about what the comics think. I'm making fun yeah. for the comics. Because all the comics would get in the back, and I perform for the comics. And he goes, you never see a, a successful comics comic. He goes, you'll never see a successful comics comic. Well, I, I feel like you have to do a little yeah. of both, you know? You don't want to be just the guy that's selling it. to. You want to, like, it's like a Doug Stanhope or something. He's doing a little bit of both. He's still trying to make the comics laugh, you know? That was a tough lesson to eat but at yeah. the fucking 12-year mark or something. Oof. Like in 2001, he but told it's, me that. But it's true. It's like you, yeah. you, spend, you, you see all these comics making that mistake. Yeah, I kept doing it. I kept doing it, and I would fucking destroy the comics in the back, but the people in the front would look at me like, you're not funny, you know? Like, did we know this shit? Like, it was just weird. I used to I watch Andy to Kindler work. Yeah. He would, the audience would do, because all the comics would come in the back, the improv, Andy Kindler would go on, and all the comics were laughing, and, and this was what the audience was doing. They just kept turning and looking around, like, what the hell are these people laughing at? Like, we don't get what is going on they didn't at get all. It. They didn't get it. <laughs> no, we'd just be like losing our shit back there. That was some advice he gave me. He told me to throw a joke out once, which you know those jokes that you get emotionally attached to? Yeah. And he was like, I know you think it's funny, but it's fucking horrible. Oh my like God. Like something crazy. And I was like, Jesus Christ. And you know, I never wanted to punch him or call him fat, you know. Like, I get it, because he's ahead of me. But you, you have need to listen to someone this. like yeah. that in your life. I, you Rich and I say all it. the time, we're like, you know, the, the, the quickest way to get unfunny is uh, to get fans. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, once you start playing to people that already like you, it's like, it's so easy to fall into that trap. That's why comedians that, that get really big, a lot of times, they have a hard time staying sharp, because they never have to, like, work through that, you know? That's what happened to me this year. You got you got too many fans. I fucking started playing to the fans and started fucking with me. Yeah. I didn't know what was fucking with me. And even when I shot the Netflix, it was fucking with me. Yeah. And then after the Netflix on the plane ride, it hit me like a punch to the fucking mouth and nose. And I was like, I've been fucking around for the last three years. I'm going back to saying shit I want to say. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. I don't give a fuck about the consequences. I'm 55. Well, that's the thing is that it's always like a little bit say? of this, yeah. a little bit of that. No, what are they going to say? Yeah. They're not going to like you. They're not going to laugh. If you're yourself, yeah. they're going to appreciate that more than anything else. I've seen guys that do a movie that have no comedic talent at all, and they go on stage and they bomb for 40 minutes, but they tell shit about themselves, and yeah. the people leave happy. Right. As long as you're yourself. That's right. all they want to see. Right. That's what the audience Some authenticity wants. of some kind. They want some authenticity. That's it. That's better than right. going up there and playing to them. That's, right. You know, I want to, every time I watch a clean comic, I go, wow, I wish I were clean. And that sets me back 2,000 fucking years. I know, but what, it's hard not to. It's hard not, when you watch a good comic, you think, well, I should be doing that. Well, when I saw John Mulaney's yeah. fucking special on Netflix, I go, why am I, uh, what, 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 what am I stupid? I got to start writing like that. And all of a sudden, you go into this writer's trap, and it's like, this isn't who you are. Right. So right. I went through that. I went through that for about two years, the last two years, and I just said, fuck it. No more set list. Right. I'm going back to comedy store comedy. Yeah. I'm going off the flow energy. I'm starting with this. it feels this, better. And wherever it takes me, that's where it takes me. And if they get offended, they shouldn't have been out on a fucking Thursday night. They're going to suck my back. <laughs> right, you know? right, right. And right. I feel better now. I feel liberated. You know, that's why I was telling you I go out every other week. I feel very liberated yeah. now. Back to back, I can't give you that 100%. So I'm cheating you. If you see me coming two weeks in a row, I'm cheating you. Right. I'm taking money out of your pocket. Right. Spend it on something else. Right. I'm tired. I'm 50. You know. Well, it takes it, it out of you. People don't realize you. doing a fucking hour. Well, you're doing two hours a night, basically. You're doing two shows. You know, I I um I was at uh, in Philly doing the um what's it called? What's that club called? Helium. 
helium and i had my dog and my kid with me and i was fucking exhausted by the end of it i mean i was just like i can't this is really hard to go out the saturday last show doing that last hour it was just like i like five shows that's <laughs> so i, I was like, like five I can't shows do this. i like five shows or i like the new three show combination i'm doing one show on friday get on the train, go somewhere else and do two shows in the yeah. bigger city. Yeah. I like that combination. I really enjoy that. Theaters would be fantastic. And the one show a night. Uh, yeah, but you have to have still two to fucking I make know. any scratch. The first I one know. goes to the house. And so the first one is always scratch. You're like, right. well, I'm taking a bullet, but at least I'm in the fucking theater now. And, you know, I'm trying. Bonnie, uh, I mean, you still, you're working out, you're taking care of yourself, you're beautiful, you got the daughter. But once, <laughs> for me, it was throwing the kid into the mix. That's what really got to me, that I didn't want to be a comic that died and then they had to learn about who I was right. or somebody else. Right, oh my God. I already got, I already was involved in a marriage that I don't see my kid. I have no communication with my kid since she's been 17, 16. And she, How come? Me and the wife just didn't, didn't click. And, you know, I think about it with this one. I go, what I would have trusted me with a kid 25 years ago no wonder. I wouldn't have trusted me. Mm -hmm. I was nuts when I was w with that kid. The kid was five. And that's when I moved away, when she was five. And then we just broke. It just broke. It just something that broke. It's like I gave up a life to get a life as a yeah. comedian. Yeah. It's, it was hard for a few years. I, I accepted it. I reached out a thousand times. It's a different world. And I live with that now. So I didn't want this to happen with her. No. So now I over overextend myself with her. Because I see it's the little things. Back then, it was, I thought it was based on money and doing shit with your kid. Your kid just wants to lay on your Your leg. kid just wants your attention. attention. That's, That's it. That's it. They want to see you light up when you when, when they walk in the room. That's it. That's it. My whole fucking wall is and an iPhone X, and yeah. that is it. No, That's all they want. <laughs> my wife won't give her. A phone. My wife lets her play with her phone. <laughs> yeah. And she texts me at night. Like yeah. She'll, she'll text me from her bed, hearts and pictures oh, of her sweet. doing shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm at that level now where I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in for Sunday dinners. Yeah. There's a rule in my house: we got to be in for Sunday dinner and eat like a family, and then I watch my 60 minutes. Well, I feel I think there's a thing where people, you know, it's all about making it big, but really, I honestly think the sweet spot is making it medium, because when you if you're if you're going to be a star, people don't realize the amount of fucking effort it takes to make it to that level and to maintain it at that level. You've got to be working and thinking about it all the time. And so if you want to have a life where, you know, like you have a kid and you have family and you have these like, you know, actual real relationships and, and um, you know, you, you really, there should be more. Everyone always says in this country, like dream big, dream big. It should be like, you know, try to pay your mortgage and then spend some time with your family. That's, I don't know. I mean, it sounds cheesy, but it's... No, it's not cheesy. It's really... Uh, let me explain something to you. I love that nobody knows who the fuck I am. I love it. I love it that... People I hate to break it to you. No. I don't know if you know how many Twitter followers you have. No, but people don't know who the fuck I am. They've, you know, Half of those Twitter followers have come and gone. they moved on to other comics by now <laughs> and shit like that. But it's so weird how... Uh, I couldn't imagine doing a Louis C.K., or Kevin Hart, that's not for me. Right. I, I even feel uncomfortable. Like the Wilbur Theater is as big as I like it. That's anything after that. It's too echoey. I feel the people uncomfortable. If it was up to me, I would I would just do two hundred seat rooms. Right. Of course. Where well, I could well, fucking be I don't huge understand. in there. Yeah. I'm huge in a 250 I seat can, room. I one hundred. I can't I'm imagine huge. doing twenty thousand. What is I mean, I guess I don't. So I get it. I get it. Like they say, if you do the garden anyway, you don't make no money. Don't make no money. At the end of the night, when you add up the tickets and the money, the union takes half of it. It's New York City, baby girl. Wow. They want, you know, 50 just for you walking in there. Then it's security, then it's advertising. Oh, yeah. I guess so. I guess so. When the people do the garden, like, they don't do it. Uh, they do it for the, to right, say, I, to did, say the I did the garden. To say I did the garden. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you need to do, like, 19 fucking shows. Like, when I was going to do New York Comedy Festival, they made me an offer. There was no money there. Right. 
I couldn't believe it. Like, there was no money. Like, they were like 25000 for advertising. Wow. What are you talking about? Why are you advertising? Mars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what the fuck are you sending signals to? Get in Puerto Rican with little flags. Right, right, the, right. That, that shit they did in the <laughs> 70s when you were stuck out on a boat. I don't give a fuck. 25 grand, you know. <laughs> so you got to think of all this shit. Puerto Rican with a flag. <laughs> you, know, you don't remember those guys? They would stand out there and give each other signals. <gasps> all that shit went to the garbage. I'm an old man. I want to know what happened to Morse code. I was tremendous at Morse code. <laughs> I was Morse motherfuckers in Australia. Tick, 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 tick. I knew Morse code when I was a kid. That's I, amazing. I was better at Morse For what code reason? To, to talk to people. Who? You? I don't know. They would tick, tick back. I don't know. I, I didn't know what the fuck was going on. In case you were kidnapped Isn't that by from the, the Titanic? Isn't that what they, you, you had a Morse code thing in your house? Yeah. You send fucking signals to people. Oh, my you God. You fuck with people. How old are you? Are you That's I'm amazing. that old. <laughs> I'm that fucking old that I knew how to send more signals. When you were in the 70s, they taught you how to do that shit in grammar school, I think. Really? Yeah. Dot, 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 dot. You learned how to do the flags in case your boat, your boat broke down. You knew how to send signals, how to do SOS. I can't even imagine you on a boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to learn all that shit as a kid in New York City. But I was a fucking the king of Morse code. I could send out fucking. Do you still know it? You think? No, I forgot uh, all that shit. And I used to know Pig Latin too when I was a kid. Oh my, my god, taught, we used to speak. My English mother taught me how to chiti, chita, chito, it's all that like, shit. Lee, isn't it? You just added ly to the end. Something or, fucking crazy. A-Y-N. In Spanish, no, yeah. but it was Spanish wise. So oh, would, you're doing you're doing, Spanish, doing Spanish pig Latin. Pig Latin. Whoa, oh my god. That's chiti, another. Chita, chito, some fucking shit. I was all confused as a kid, sending more signals to people. Morse fucking code. That was how bad to the bone I was. Tick tick tick. There was like a whole little chart <laughs> and you would just fuck with people and send them Morse codes. <laughs> they couldn't trace your calls, you know, there was no call oh waiting. Oh my god. There was no nothing. This was straight up people would send <laughs> I mean, we used to have one of those walkie talkies where we'd sometimes get somebody on there. Oh, yeah. Do you remember the Pittsburgh funny bone? Yeah. The guy was a fucking pervert. Yeah. He was creepy. He had lawn furniture for fucking... Uh, he had sued the funny bone and broke away from them so he could do whatever the fuck he wanted. Oh, to. I didn't know that. So the whole bar was pictures of naked women, <laughs> you know, artistically taken by him. <laughs> but you could tell this motherfucker was Harvey Jr. because he had a couple of them that had bushes and shit. But this guy... I only went there with Rich. You only but, went there with Rich? Okay. Yeah. He had a room. So, like, Thursday, he was too cheap to pay the radio, but one guy liked him, and they put you, like, AM Sports. And then Friday, you went to his house, and you you got a CB. No. Dog, he had something like ham radio. This is 1995, oh, when The Longest crazy, Yard but... came out. I probably went there from 95 to 98. What I, is he doing on a CB radio? He would sit there, and I remember I told him, I said, what time are we he doing? He had the first this? podcast. He had the first podcast. <laughs> oh and didn't know it. Like truckers and stuff? Something. And only three or four people would listen to it. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is the truth. In his basement. And we would sit there, and it was like it would come on AM, and nobody would listen to it. Because I asked him, like, anybody listen to People were like, no, it's terrible. He's terrible. He doesn't know what he's doing. But he, I remember the, one of the last times I went there, we got into a fight over that p- podcast because I said, listen, we got to go eat. And he's like, I told you. And I go, I don't give a fuck what you told me. I took the earphones off. I said, throw me out. I don't give a fuck. Get me the fuck out of here. I'm 40 years old on a CB ham radio to doing a fucking, there wasn't even a podcast. And it was 96, guys, 97, 98. I was like, get me the fuck out of here. And that was it. After that, he never booked me again. And then I heard he sold the club years later or something. Yeah, he had his own little radio station downstairs in his house. And he would talk to you about the funny bone, his pictures and shit. He was a creepy fucking dude, man. I just want to know what you said to those poor people on Morse code. You probably, I can I just didn't imagine know. them Go on the other end. Like, Who the fuck knows? They would just get signals <laughs> from me and panic. This is for official business. <laughs> I used to fuck with people at every age. I was looking at my daughter. SOS. I'm looking at my daughter last night. She's five and a half. She bet she's the cutest and, thing. And there. I was thinking about when I was doing the five and a half. <laughs> I lived on 88th Street. And my mother would give Do you me, remember yeah. what, yourself at five and a half? Well, this could only be five and a half or six and a half. Right. Because I was still crazy. It was before, <laughs> I, it was before I got hit in the head with the lunchbox. I got hit in the head with the lunchbox in Central Park. But we lived on 88th Street. And my mother had a jukebox at the bar. Yeah. So she would give me all the old records that they would take out of the bar. And and there was, and, and still to this day, people send me pictures of 205 West 88th Street. 
It's the corner building, but next to it was a parking garage. And we would play stickball on there and, you know, handball. And there was a sign that said fallout shelter. And we used it as a basketball thing, a hoop. You know, this is like... It was a really uh, fallout shelter? Yeah, in the 80s, in the 70s. When I got here from Cuba, everybody had a fallout shelter because, you know, the Russians. Right, uh, right. uh, Vaders. So every building would have a sign in front of it that said fallout shelter. And it would have like a radioactive sign. <laughs> and that meant in case of something, you'd go downstairs right, you go to the down. basement, lock yourself in. And they had like tang and vegetables in a can. Right, they're, they're ready. Yeah, for... and then you come out when the apocalypse is over. Oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, so they had fallout shelters. And I'll never forget that. There was a garage and the kids would play stickball. But the way my building was shaped, it was like it went up three stories. And on the third floor where I lived, now I could see my neighbors that lived on the other side of the hallway. We could see that yard where they would play. I could see them and hear them, but they couldn't see me. So they'd be playing stickball, and I'd take those fucking 45s, those singles, <laughs> and I'd whip them out the window. <laughs> and by the time they got to the fucking bottom level, they're like a boomerang. Oh, you God, that could, could decapitate <laughs> oh somebody. Oh, my God. I'm, would... I'm surprised you're like, odd job from 007. I'm surprised you didn't take anyone's head off. <laughs> I would sit there for like a, for like a three-minute run. I would just throw out singles out of the oh window. Oh, my God. And the kids were yelling, who the fuck is doing that? Stop it. And all of a sudden, you would be like, Right into the full oh, motion. Yeah. Like one time I went down, and I would do it, and then go downstairs and ask what happened. What's oh. all, what's all, <laughs> the gas light, Like, what's all the commotion about? Some fucking... Somebody's throwing singles out the oh record. Oh, my God. And they God. hit me in the head. I go, yeah, there's a crazy guy living up there. <laughs> oh, my God. That was such a fun. I remember I shit my pants one time. And, and you were five like, and a half? You said yeah, five probably. and a half or six. And I would not wipe my ass. Oh. So my mom would take my underwears and staple them to the front of my door so I wouldn't bring my friends over. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had to wipe my ass because I wouldn't wipe my ass. And she'd say, how do you not wipe your ass? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I forget. Some tough love there. And then she would go, okay, next time you fucking come up with a dirty underwear, I'm hanging on the wall. I thought she was fucking around. Oh, she my God. She stapled it on the top of the wall. That's such uh, a mom thing. How long did it stay up there for? Like for a week. Oh, and every time I shit my pants, she would staple them up against the wall like a, <laughs> like a trophy for me to look at. It. How did you learn to wipe your ass? <laughs> <laughs> Not that, not like that. I can't imagine Mercy doing. Mer- Mercy's like a little, like a little kid. I can't imagine you throwing. Did you ever get caught throwing the record? They never figured it out until I got. I, mm-hmm. When I moved out of there, until the day I moved out of there, I would wait till I had like forty singles, oh. and I would just do. I wait till there was a ton of kids out there on a Saturday playing, and I just start whipping them out. Oh the my wind. god! And they would come around like flying saucers, <laughs> and you would hear the guys, "Fuck you." And then also in that hallway, we would light fires. I was like a, not a pervert. Pyromaniac. I was a pyromaniac. (laughs) (laughs) Listeners, if any of your parents or anyone lived in that area during that time, because someone has told the story about the records. (laughs) When I lived on 88th Street, the first, like, my father died when I was three. (laughs) Bonnie, I was lost. My mom was a single mom, trying to do the best she could. You know, she owned the bar. We, right. She made good money. But those years, I put her through hell. Like, I look at my daughter and go, I'm going to pay for all those sins. <laughs> all yeah. those sins I did to my mom those years were fucking cruel. Like, the, the shit. You can only really come to terms <laughs> with this shit when you have a kid, right? Then you start thinking about your mom That's in a it. different that, way. I really like, do. I yeah. really do. I look yeah. at it. Last night, I was looking at it. I'm like, I remember throwing singles. Out the back fucking window, like, and then going downstairs, and people be cut, their heads oh. would be cut. So, shit. what would you set on fire? I would set newspapers on fire. Anything I could set on fire in those days. I love fire too, as a kid. As a that kid, was I, really lo- I was, I, I loved fire, and I would set fire to everything. <laughs> like anything I could light on fire around the corner, I had a lighter. I figured out how to get a lighter, and I I would light a fire. Like the kids that I hung out with on 140. Oh, anytime Street, I saw a lighter laying around, I stole. That I stole shit. it. Yeah. So one day there was in behind that building, the building next to it, if you went around the back, there was stared down to the basement. And we would go back there and do shit. And one day I go, I start a fire. Me and like two other kids, three other kids. And we put a bunch of newspaper back there and we lit this fire. And in those days I would light a fire and turn and pee on it. Like I was buck wild and turn the fire off. And this one day I lit this fire in like this hallway 
Like it was just a single person could walk down the stairs and it was outside. It wasn't inside the building. Before I fucking knew it, the fire just blew up and I'm out of piss. Like I'm out of piss and all my buddies are out of piss and we're like, what are we gonna do? I'm like, get the fuck out of here. And I'll never forget running upstairs and locking myself in the door and watching the fire department go back there and turn off the fucking fire. Like we were crazy. Turn off the fire. Turn off the I fire. I like how you make it sound so easy. It was just a little fire. Like, nobody got hurt or nothing like that. It was just a stairway that just ignited. We put, like, a tree. Oh, but you it, know, every day we got a little cocky. Jesus. Yeah, I was a little pyro. I felt your entire plan was just to pee on it. That, too. But I no. was just a little pyro. I loved it. What do you got with your daughter? We got time here. I just got to make sure I got Because Rich really, you know, he called me before coming in. He said, talk about the roast. He said, if you don't talk about the roast, I'm going to kill you. The, the roast is so well. the, the roast is fucking hilarious. Uh, Vossroast.com. Uh, yeah, 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 it's fucking hilarious. Yeah, so for his 60th birthday, we we did um did a roast of him with all his, you know, his friends, Jim Norton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's tremendous. And uh, whatever. I don't know. He wants... I don't know what to say about it. It was to good. Say, say it was really good. <laughs> was I, re- good. I retweeted from. I, I bought it. I think it was five dollars, four dollars, three dollars. It's uh, yeah, it's on Vimeo. It's five bucks. Yeah, five uh, bucks. I to to it. rent it, but you might as well buy it for ten because you're gonna watch it. Watch. Yeah, it my wife times. even watched it. My wife is a big Rich Voss fan. She's an American Indian. What? All right. So one night, me and my wife were having a regular conversation. We were dating in the living room. There was no kid in our future. I think I was still doing blow, and I'm ready to go out. And Rich Voss is on some. Uh, you know, Colin Quinn show, that show. Yeah, yeah, whatever. tough crowd. And he's talking shit about something. And he goes, I did, when I was a kid, the teacher would tell me to go uh, lay down Indian <laughs> No, style. go sit Indian style. style. So I would go lay in the gutter with a bottle or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah. And <laughs> Get a and, bottle and, and lay in the You know, the when curve. you're having a conversation with somebody and like you both hear something? <laughs> yeah. Like we both heard Uh-oh. it. And I didn't want to laugh because she's American Indian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. But we both busted out. <laughs> and ever since then, Rich is like my wife's favorite fucking That's comic. crazy. That's See, that crazy. goes against everything we've been taught recently. Yeah, no, is, no, no, no. My yeah. wife fell in love with Rich after that joke. And then Rogan told me a couple things about Caroline that Rich said one night, like a long time ago, that today Rich would have got thrown out in prison. Yeah. <laughs> if he would have said well, this joke. You know, if you- <laughs> but Rogan said that it was him and Rich, and Rich went up to Rogan and goes, watch this. Oh, like it was shit. one of those things, like. Rogan, Rich went up the road and go watch this. And uh, goes, Isn't it funny that fucking? Uh, are you sure you should say the this? Chick, what's the chick that I forgot who? I, I forget the joke. I'm just gonna kill it. So forget about. It. Well, he's. I, I know, like, uh, you know, actually for the roast, we went and interviewed Rich's friends, and you know, because everybody hated Rich when they first met him. And so we made this little video of uh, you know uh, them saying that the first time they met Rich, and. Um, you know, it's like there's so many black comics that w- were like, I saw him on stage. I said, who's this fucking white guy? Because uh, he, he used to do all black rooms. You know, that's 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 where he started. And he would beat him up. And he would go after he him, him, this him little up, fucking bro. Jew. And, and, and they said they'd watch him for a few minutes and then they'd go, oh, this guy's got fucking balls, man. <laughs> and then they'd like him after that, that's you know. What, that's what it is. That's I think that's came. his appeal is that he just, I even see it now with these you know, politically correct audiences is that Rich goes up and then they try to bully you, you know, into to, to, to not saying or doing what they think you shouldn't say or do. And f- that noise doesn't bother Rich. He doesn't care. He doesn't hear it or he doesn't notice it. And he just does what he wants to do. And at some point, the audience just goes, nah, oh, well, <laughs> he's not going to change. They, I don't know if it. they know. Rich is the type of comic that if you turn on him, Rich would just step on the pedal a lot harder. Yeah, He's yeah. the old school type kind of, oh, you didn't like that joke? Yeah. Well, I got another one to really get your panties yeah. on fire. And if your cunt wife don't like that joke, wait yeah. till the joke after that one. Yeah. She's going to shit her fucking pants. You might as well leave right now. Once you have that type of, of, of he's been doing it 30 years too, He's right? got funny in his bones, man. Yeah, he is, he's been doing he's, it 30 he's, years he's, now. Yeah, so yeah. He can like do any him, room at any time. It doesn't matter. Yeah. He'll do any room, spin it. Torture him, take him through different emotions. That's what you do at that level. At that level, you take him, you control him like a puppeteer. You well, can really control him. You can push him a little bit. Listen, all my audiences, like when you just said about politically incorrect, I don't give a fuck about them. Right. When so at I'm some point stage, they'll come, yeah. they'll come around because they're I'm like, well, stage, I guess that's the, I guess this guy's, yeah, this ain't ABC, bitch. Yeah. And you know what? 
you got stuck on the wrong channel. Like when you yeah. get stuck on Telemundo and you can't <laughs> yeah. find the remote. When you get stuck on Telemundo and you can't find the remote, you don't know what the fuck's going on. Why won't this lady stop speaking Spanish on my TV? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's me on stage yeah, now. Yeah. I don't give a fuck. I'm not yeah. going to stop. You know, whether it's the comedy store, you know, I'm doing a Laugh Factory with Dom tomorrow. You stumble in there tomorrow night, you're a tourist, you know, and you're like, oh my God, this is where... Dan, Dan but Cook. you should be seeing yeah, that I don't, stuff. You should I be cannot, seeing a variety of things. I cannot. I you know? cannot. I have to. Stay at home if you want listen, it to be safe. Do you know what the fuck I was doing 36 years ago? It wasn't putting my hand over women's mouths. It was fucking going to gay clubs and getting drugs. It was robbing drug dealers. There was not a fucking day of peace. Right. I quit high school in 81. I quit high school in October of 81. That was That started... A two-year thing that ended with me robbing a fucking jewelry store and going to Sarasota, Florida. Oh my god! You know this was this was just yes. Yeah, so that's what I was doing in nineteen. But you never went to jail. I went to jail in 87, 88. Oh. I got arrested in, in, For what in was Colorado. Second degree burglary, but it was kidnapping oh. and aggravated robbery oh, with a gun. Shit. Yeah, I went deep like rich. You just go deep on those drugs, <laughs> and then you you know you wake up one day and whatever. But tired of being tired. Well, you can't come to me now and say that. I robbed you with a fucking, I robbed Georgie Amico's gas station with a water pistol in 1981. You can't come <laughs> with a water pistol? Yeah, with a, I put, I, I Would fucking, you paint a water pistol? I took a water pistol and just put tape around it. Electrical oh, tape. You shit. make it look shiny. They don't know. And you drill out the hole. Oh, You drill my out God. the hole in the middle. So Because a lot of times people show up with the gun with the little, the, the orange gun, thing. Yeah, with the, with the orange thing. thing. <laughs> and you got to smack for the fucking mouth. <laughs> How long are you in town for, Bonnie? Um, I leave Friday morning. Are you doing any spots while you're here? I'm doing some spots at the store, doing a couple at the uh, improv, and uh, then I'm doing uh, just a bunch of meetings and stuff and promoting You still got Boss shit going on? Com. <laughs> Boss and My Wife Hates Me podcast. My Wife Hates Me, yeah, we still do that. Now, how many times a week do you put one out? We do two. We do one for Patreon and one regular, okay. you know. And, uh, you like doing podcasts? You're great on them. I don't mind doing them. I some. T- I mean, I think like when Rich and I do it, sometimes I get embarrassed. Like I feel like we're putting all our shit out there. He loves it. He doesn't care. He's got no boundaries. You know. You can't. And uh, sometimes at the after like, during it, I'm fine. Then after, sometimes I lay on my bed and go, oh, "What did we talk about?" Like we'll have full blown fucking marital fights on that podcast. That's what it's all about. That's what, we, what people want to hear. I know. That's what people want to hear. That's why people tune in. They don't I know, hear but about, I want to be cool. Listen, nobody <laughs> wants to talk about the couple that takes their kid to the pool and then life is happy. <laughs> right. That's just on fucking television. That doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah, and yeah. people are going through that right now. So when you guys are actually going through that, people are listening to you going, fuck, I thought my marriage was bad. Oh, my God. I think we yeah, do. You, you know what I'm people, saying? Like, people write me all the time and say, like, I hugged my wife today. <laughs> you know, they feel bad. <laughs> we make people feel better about their marriage. But, you know, we've been we've been married 13 years. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes I see other people get divorced. They say, what the fuck? How does that happen that we're still together? But. You know what it is? He just still really fucking makes me laugh, that guy. Even in the middle of a fight sometimes, we'll both just bust out laughing. He's, you know, then go then we'll get right back to the fight, you know. We don't we don't let go of it. <laughs> but uh You look happy. You look great, man. You he's know? a good guy. He's, yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. And God bless him. I'm 55 and I'm like, "Do I really want to be doing comedy at 61?" God bless him. I called he, him a few he, weeks he ago. He never he wants was, to quit. No, he was somewhere. He had just. Oh, he was yes. in, I called him. He had just gotten to Kentucky. Yeah. He was pissed. Yeah. He was pissed, and I made him laugh, and I felt yeah, so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. he was like, "I'm fucking in Kentucky. I don't know what's going on." I'm like, well, that's a great club. Yeah. That's a great club comedy on Broadway. That's a tremendous <laughs> little club. I mean, when, they got ducks outside. What are you pissed off about? They got a little <laughs> pond with ducks. What do you got to be pissed off about? You got the world by the balls. He loves being on stage. You like New York, living in New York? You miss L.A. at all? You have any regrets? I do miss L.A. sometimes, but uh, no, I have no regrets. I, you know, th- there was a lot, you know, I had just done an HBO special, and then um, I moved to the middle of New Jersey and had a baby, and sometimes I feel like that was probably not the best career move. But then I came around to, like, I have all this, you know? I mean, I really do have a nice life. I have a, you know... When you stop comparing yourself to others, I know it sounds so fucking cheesy, but you really do start to realize like, oh my God, I got all this free time during the day to write and, um, you know, I did all this stuff one day. I was like 
went to the dry cleaners and I, I just was doing errand after errand. I told Rich all the things I did and I said, I just stopped and I was like, oh my God, people do that and have a full-time job. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like really, you but know. you know, my day doesn't stop either. I mean, my day doesn't stop. Today, I had a great night's sleep last night. Oh my God. I didn't move for like eight hours. <laughs> nice. Those are those are rare. And I, I took a nap in the afternoon. I fell asleep on the plane on the way back from Boston. But last night was just brilliant. And I got up this morning with venom in my eyeballs. <laughs> Why? Like at seven thirty. No, I wasn't in a bad oh, mood. I was oh, in a oh. phenomenal mood, but I was fucking ready to go. Yeah, yeah. I didn't stop. I went from one move to the next to the next to the next acupuncture. I knew you were gonna call me. As soon as I fucking laid down, he goes, you want to get that? And I go, no, I know who the fuck it is already. You said after 12.30. I go, no, because I was going in there. After I fly, I usually go to acupuncture oh. on Monday. And it works? Work. Yeah, he cleans me the fuck out. Wow. He even told me, he goes, oh, yeah, you can, I can tell you. Because he does the computer. You hold the two, the two magnetos at first, and then he goes through your body. And he could tell me what's going on. He said, you got a problem there and you digest them. Yeah, because I, I travel. My so. friend uh, swears by it. I, I got to try that. This is probably 13 years I'm on it now. Wow. My ankles, just, when I first started going, my ankles were really thick. I had a problem with circulation. And that's the money. That's wow. why those Chinese people leave to be on. That's why they, they smoke more cigarettes than us, but there's less cancer there. Because they have, their bodies are more oxygenated. Plus, they do that Tai Chi. They just go outside right. and, and push the air. That's got to do something for you, that yeah. Tai Chi shit. Yeah. So you look beautiful. You know, I'm happy. You're still doing your fucking thing, you know? I like doing stand-up. I, you know, I do it. Uh, I still do it every weekend. Now, right now, like, look at the, the life you're living. When you train that in to be Amy Schumann to put a fucking... A target on your back. Well, you know, I've you thought know, about it. I could, I could never be that. I just know I could never I, I, be I that. I don't want that. I never yeah. wanted that. I was, yeah. I was, when I got into comedy, it was just to save me. Yeah. I didn't expect anything or whatever. Everything has been a cherry on a Sunday. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I take it for what it is right now. You know, the, like, oh, after Netflix comes out, I go, listen, I'm still sticking to the same schedule. Right. I had to tell everybody right. the agency and my, like, it's great, but. Well, that's the thing. You got to push so hard to get to that level. I'm still sticking to the same level because that's the level that I work at the best. Right. You know, that's where you, because for me, it's all about being creative. I want to just be creative. Every time I want to go on stage, I want to feel enthusiastic about it. Right. It's like that dude. I watched that Molly's game and she quotes that dude and she goes, uh, success is moving from from area to area with full enthusiasm. Yeah. And it really is. Tuesdays and Mondays you do a podcast. Fucking yes. great. I don't even I wouldn't even consider doing stand up today. Right. I don't care what you pay me. I'm focused on the fucking podcast yeah. today. So yeah. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, those are my podcast days. Right. And then, you know, on the weekend you do comedy. Right. And then for a week I'm a fucking dad straight. Right. I'm at karate, I'm at fucking pool. So and I'm enthused at every level. How many times you should let your daughter stand when she was a kid going, What am I doing with my life? An hour of fucking ballet class. I, and, I, I, yeah, I wasn't that thrilled about the dance class. All that shit. <laughs> but guess what? You got to do that. You know what I see? But here? you know what? It refills you. It refuels you. When I sit you know? there with her after twenty minutes, I go, "What the fuck am I doing with my life?" <laughs> I get material. I think of things. Yes. I got a lot of material. Plus, that's well, what you she wait likes. till she gets older. She's gonna be such a great sounding. Like I've always wanted a friend that just hung out and you do bits all day with. And that's what I have. I have an 11 year old that loves fucking doing bits all day. You know, so it's like we go to the park, we hang out. It's, it's you pushing her into comedy? No, no, no. I don't think kids. Uh, I don't like. I don't like when kids want to be in show business. I don't like it either. Thank God we agree on the one thing. I don't like it. It's fucking creepy. Yeah. And it crips these fucking kids out forever. It's too creepy. Yeah. Even three years on a sitcom. For these kids is traumatizing. They see a world from a different view. They have, they have, they have. Ad, it's like a, it, it fucks with this natural order of things. Adults aren't supposed to be talking to you and hanging on your every word like you're the smartest person in the room, you know. And when you're the star of a show, even if you're only fourteen, that's what everybody does. <laughs> you know, their jobs depend on it. What days does the podcast come out? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. You know, we we don't. We just, uh, we don't just do it, it whenever we can do it and put it out. And so one a week. Out. Yeah, usually it's Wednesday or Thursday. But and you have a lot of dates coming up. Um, you know, I work mostly in New York on the weekends. In the New York area. Yeah. You stay Jersey. You do the Artie Lang tour. 
Yeah. Holly Lang yes. just works every week in Jersey. I don't know how the fuck he does it. <laughs> yes. Him and him and the Reverend. Bob Levy. They're fucking savages. <laughs> you know, they're in Baskin Ridge. I think Bob Levy's the one. He's the driving force of that trade. Is he really? Yeah, I think he is. He's a savage. They're yeah. savages. He's they're always in Jersey. like. <laughs> they're in Jersey every fucking week. I love it. Yeah. Like, if I live in Jersey, I would go on their tour. Yeah. That's it. It's a tour of just Jersey. Every week you're in some fucking different neighborhood in Jersey. And Jersey's not what it used to be either. There's some politically correct motherfuckers now in Jersey. I used to always say I think this. Hoboken. I think I think Jersey still is. I say, Nobody's ever been like, oh, about a joke in Jersey. And in I Hoboken? still feel like that's true. How about in Hoboken? It's, this, it's the, uh, Hoboken too. Hoboken's got a lot of comedy? Um, Do they have a weekly thing? Yeah, they have some weekly shit there. But still, the, the club is a stress factory in New Jersey. That's no, it's still, just, I love it. I have, a, I have a show there once a month. Uh, first, uh, I, I'm actually supposed to be there on the third. But the first Wednesday uh, of every month. You have a show there? Yeah, with uh, uh, Allie Mae. Okay. So... Good for you, Bonnie. It yeah. was great to see you. Like Thank said, you for having you know, me on. This is when awesome. When you were a young girl, I spoke to fucking uh, your husband, and he told me you were coming out, and I go, listen, you know, she's always welcome. I'd love <laughs> to see you. He's always booking me on things. God bless him. No, thank God. He's I thought the best. About you. Yeah. you know, you're great, and I haven't seen you, and it's weird that we talked about Ralphie a little bit, and we found out that this week is his one-year anniversary. Yeah, on the 6th, right? <clears throat> so it was... Uh, it was bittersweet to even do the podcast. We'll dedicate yeah. it to him. Dedicate like it to Ralphie, man. So it was great to see you again. I'll see you motherfuckers next weekend in West Palm Beach. I'm just doing Friday and Saturday. And two weeks after that, the 25th to the 27th, I'm at Hilarities in Cleveland with my main man, George Perez. All right, I want to thank Bonnie McFarlane for coming in. Don't forget, she's over at the Stress Factory the first Wednesday of every month. She's a sweetheart. I'm, I'm so happy we got her on the show today. But let me talk to you real quick about something. Sure, watching football is fun, but it's more entertaining when you have some action on the games, all right? Listen, I used to be like a part-time degenerate gambler. I don't like paying the bookmaker. It was between snorting coke or paying the bookie, so I decided to snort coke. But I can't watch a game if I don't bet it. So you heard me talking about this for weeks, and some of you are still on the sidelines. Whether you're an expert or a rookie, you should be betting at my bookie. If you're the kind of guy that likes to bet a little bit and win a lot, like playing the numbers on the roulette, you can create a big parlay. Pick three teams to win, and if you hit all three, you'll turn $100 into $600. The holidays are coming, cocksuckers. It's not just football. You can bet on anything. This weekend, you got the MMA fight, right? Conor McGregor steps into the octagon against Khabib. You can do this. You can bet it straight up, or whether the hell Khabib will knock him out in the first round. You can bet a bunch of things. I recommend my book of the year because I really trust them. That's why. This is the one bet I know you'll be happy with all season long. Now, my bookie has been in business for years. They got great online reviews, and their mobile site is easy peasy to use. Now, if you're on the sidelines, now is the time to get in the game. It's October. You've already given. Listen, this is the way to go. This is the time to get in the game, and my bookie will still match your first deposit dollar for dollar. That means if you put a G note in there, they'll give you a G note, but you got to join today. Because they're pulling it, that offer soon. Log into my bookie right now. Right now, today. Right now. It's Monday Night Football. At least put a bet in on Monday Night Football. What are you sitting there like a mook for? Use promo code CHURCH, C H U R C H, and you'll get the first deposit matched 100%. That's promo code CHURCH, C H U R C H. You play, you win, you get paid. So you put 200 in the account tonight, you get 400 to win with, to play with this weekend for Conor McGregor. Go to my bookie, all right, right now and double your money. Use promo code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, and you'll get your first deposit matched at 100%. That's my bookie. I want to thank my bookie. I want to thank on it, but most importantly, I want to thank you guys. Don't forget uh, West Palm Beach next Friday and Saturday. I had to cut Thursday out. I had a meeting in town. And then the following week, the 25th, 26th, and 27th, I'm at the Cleveland Hilarities, ready to rock and roll with my brother George Perez. Listen, have a great weekend. Stay black, and Uncle Joey loves you. Kick this fucking mule, Lily.